Holy, the Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 10th chapter. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I was sharing with some uh, some good friends last night that uh, <clears throat> it's hit me in the last month that I'm old. Um, our daughter's graduating from college next month. My son's graduating from high school the month after. I'm just turned fifty nine. <sighs> I'm well into what they call the last third of life. It's a scary thought. Um, because what comes next? Yeah, I know grandkids, all this stuff, and to be honest, I'm not really holding my breath, but um, there is something about coming to, to face this, uh, this reality, you know, that our lives don't necessarily go on as they do or as they are forever. Um, things will come to the end, things will stop working, or at least working right, um, things will stop making sense to me more so than they already do. All these things will happen as I get older. I'll see people that I think are impossibly too young to be in public service or in the pulpit going, what does that young whippersnapper have to say? I, I can hear my father in this so, so strongly. And that's our lot in life. You know, we... we go through life, and we mature. And we wonder sometimes, what is it we have to show for it? What does it really all amount to in the end? You know, has there been any significance? Will anybody notice when I'm gone? I mean, that's kind of at the heart of a lot of these fears, I'm sure, in me and in many others. Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the temple. The Gospel of John stretches its chapter out over almost six months of time. And the Gospel of John begins with Jesus speaking about he's being the good shepherd, and it's, it's early in the temple near the Passover time, and now it's December. It's the season of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. And he's still in the temple speaking about the good shepherd and his sheep. But it's an important point he's trying to get across, not just to his followers, but those who are opposed to him. I, I read this first part of this text, and the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And he says, I've been doing all sorts of things. If that hasn't convinced you, what has? It reminds me of the story about the Amish man who was approached by a young pastor, a young evangel evangelist. And he, he said, uh, have you, are you a born-again Christian? And the Amish, Amish man told him, why are you asking me? I could tell you anything I want to tell you. He says, here's the name of my banker, here's the name of my grocer, and here's the name of my supplier. Ask them whether or not I'm a Christian or not. Our lives speak through the way we live them, not 
what we want to put on any platitude. A lot of people will take on that label of Christian today because it suits their political or, or business or their ambition. But what do their works show about them? What does their lives say about what they believe? When Jesus comes and says he's the good shepherd, that he leads his sheep through the valley of the shadow of death, when he speaks and they know him and they follow him, and he gives them eternal life and no one can snatch them out of his hand, he's speaking about more than just life after death, which is important. I mean, that's why we rejoice in the season of Easter. We celebrate the fact that God has the power even greater than death and has promised that there's life even beyond death for us. But Jesus promises something more as the shepherd. Jesus comes that they might have life and have it abundantly. A shepherd leads his sheep or her sheep to places where there is plenty of nourishment. A place to eat the grass and the other things that sheep eat. And, and, and it takes them to a place where they are safe, where they can feel somewhat secure. And it's not just anywhere they want to go. It's the place where he takes them. Now the sheep don't pay good, much attention to what's going on around them. They're focused on what's in front of them to eat and where the other sheep are going. But the shepherd also protects them from not just walking off a cliff, but from wolves and other animals that would want to do them harm. He keeps guiding them into places that are safer for them. Maybe not necessarily where they think they want to go, but where he knows it's safe for them to go where they can have more life and more grass to eat. And he knows when the seasons change, it's time to move to another place. And he leads them there when it's time to be moving on. When they get hurt, he cares for them. When they get frightened or spooked, he tries to calm them down. Shepherd provides more than just protection. Good shepherd cares for his sheep. When confronted with an animal, the shepherd will stand between that attacker and his sheep. The sheep don't recognize it. They don't see that. They just react to things. They don't see what's going on behind Which is amazing because Jesus says here that his sheep do. His sheep have seen the miracles. And from that have come to know that he's really the shepherd. He's the Messiah. The authorities, the ones who are questioning him, the ones who you would expect to understand and get this deeper sense of who the shepherd is, who Jesus is, are the ones asking the questions. Tell us plainly, we don't understand we don't see how this works out. If you are the one, tell us plainly. There are a lot of people today that think that you don't have to be in church. You don't have to be part of a, a religion in order to, to have a connection to God. That you can see God in the world all around you. That there is a, a confirmation that there is a God in existence. And he's great and powerful and majestic just by engaging in the world around you. In a lot of ways, they're right. We don't see that. We lose our focus because of those things that are right just around us. The life that we have to get through today to get to tomorrow or those things we've got to plan out three weeks in advance so we have a little time in our schedule 
And we get so engrossed in those things that we lose sight of the majestic blessings of the creation around us that God has given us. And in those things, there is an inspiration for hope. When things seem to be so busy and rat racy for us, when we seem like we're just not getting ahead, we're not being fed by anything, we've lost sight of the greater glory of God that surrounds us. And I'm not just talking about up in the Shenandoah or at the ocean shore. I'm talking about just in your backyard, in your home, at night standing on your porch and looking up with, through all the lights at the night sky and imagining how far does that go? What kind of power are all those stars running on? And how long ago did I, that light left there to come to me? And to realize the God that knows me by name, that shepherds me, is the one who created all that. And to understand the importance of what this shepherd is leading me to, an abundant life, in the here and now as well as in the day to come. That's part of faith. That's part of what binds us together and helps us get through even into that last third of life. That even if nobody else remembers, even if I make no difference on this earth at all, I matter to the shepherd. A shepherd who would be willing to leave the others behind to go find me when I wander off. The shepherd who cares enough to take us to places we don't necessarily always want to go because it's better for us. The shepherd who will stand between me and danger and put his life at risk for me. This is the Messiah. This is the son of the living God who created heaven and earth and all that is in it. The God who has given us the creation as our playground, as our place to enjoy. And in that we see the mysteries and the majesty of God. Now make no mistake, these things are God's. They may seem like they're ours, but they're God's. It's in this majesty that we come to understand that God has entrusted us with responsibilities. That it is as sacred on the rivers or in the mountains as it is in this holy place. They are all places that God provides, that God resides, God is present and speaks to us. And so just as we care for our homes and for our church, we have to care for those things God has entrusted to us. To give them for us, not just ourselves, but for others. To have that abundant life. Even if sometimes that takes us places we don't want to go. Even if that means that we, well, can't just do everything we want to do. Even if it means we have to come face to face with evil or danger or risk. We're not there alone. 
the shepherd walks beside us, walks behind us, and stands in front of us. There's a lot to do in the last third of life. There's a lot still to come. There is much to do in this world. I have 10,000 reasons. Do you? Amen.